Let's turn back to Ephesians, the first chapter again, to continue our consideration of this great letter that Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And let's try and capture, if we can, something of the same inspiration that was doubled in what Ephesians believed in the letter came to them. Ephesians chapter 1. And I think we uh, were about to discuss uh, verse 10 and verse 14. Some other read again, please. Chapter 1, verse 10 to 14. And in the dispensation of the fullness of times, of the times, you might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Thank you very much. Now verse 10. In the dispensation and fullness of the times, he might gather together one all things in Christ. What does, what does the word dispensation mean? A certain period of time. Yes, that's not exactly, that's the usual definition, but to what do, it really means. To do away with? No, to, 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 give, out, to give out, out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. to give out, right? To give out, right? We talk about this dispensation, there's a period when certain things have been given out, and later a different dispensation comes in. Now, the Old Testament is usually go as one, as one dispensation, is it not? And the New Testament is a new dispensation. New dispensation. Is there a difference between the salvation of the Old Testament and the New Testament? No. 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 It's the same gospel, the same uh, power of God to save from sin in both cases. Now, some churches, of course, teach that the Old Testament was a dispensation of law and the New was a dispensation of the gospel. The Jews say by a different system altogether from the from, from Christian, which of course is not true. Now, when Paul says that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, to what period is he then referring? When will the fullness of time be achieved? When Christ comes again. Right. At the end of 6,000 years of human suffering and woe, we'll enter into that period when we'll find ourselves in heaven and dispensation of full fruition of the gospel plans and purposes. When that time comes, what will God do? He will gather together in one all things of Christ, which are in heaven and which are on the earth, in him. <coughs> and that's a very wonderful prospect, is it not? Yes. A beautiful prospect. As we look to the time when he will gather together in one all things in Jesus Christ. Now, what is the one of the great curses of sin in this world? Disunity, many voices. This one saying, "I have the truth," and says, "I have the truth," and so on. And it's quite a weary to the spirit to find oneself confronted by all these different claims to have the truth of God at the present time. But when that time comes, how many voices will there be? One. Only one voice, only one truth, only one message going forward to every being in heaven and on the earth at that time. Now, it says it will all be in him, in who? Christ. In Jesus Christ. Now, what position will Christ occupy in, in, eternity, in, in eternity? It will be the head of the church, right? Now, what is the purpose of the head? To direct the body. Right, to direct the body, to, to coordinate the body, to organize the body and to lead the body. And the will of the head, of course, is carried by the body. And thus, the will is executed. So in this coming dispensation, we find Christ will be the head supreme of the Church of God with no distracting honors whatsoever and be one unified, glorious whole. 
I mean, a normal human physical body, a healthy body, of which the head is in command, do we find unified action? Yes. Very much so. In fact, I think that the page of 2 Corinthians 12, of course, you know, there's a very beautiful chapter by Paul, which deals with the human body, and shows how it is a symbol or an object lesson of the Church of God, with Christ as the head, and the people of God, the members, one and all. That's my mind, a very beautiful picture of how the church should function, hands on the divine order. <clears throat> now, verse 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. I think back in Romans chapter 8, Paul talked about, about heirs. Let's go back to chapter 8 in just a moment of Romans. Romans 8, and. Uh, Verses 12 to, 6 to 17. So, I'm right to please. Satan is frustrated that day 
by going in with his own imagination and successfully fought in the work of God. That's a sad picture of human history right at the very beginning of time. So the fear is that uh, God is not working all things according to the, the good counsel of his will. It appears that way. But is it so? No. How do we reconcile the appearances with the, with the actuality? Well, because God turns every single thing into an object lesson of success and victory in the end. Now, this this sad uh, picture of 6,000 years of sin, of course, will be a lesson book through all eternity to, to, to the various, various unborn beings. And by it, we'll learn something of the wonders of God's salvation. Now, for 6,000 years, or almost 6,000 years, mankind's failed to achieve what God has destined him to achieve. And we ask ourselves a question, how can this final generation, which is the weakest of all, the most depraved of all, succeed with the rest of fail? Who's thought of that? Only, okay. It's only a, an apparent paradox. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's logical to ask the question, is it not? Yes. Very, very logical. And uh, if we dwell upon that question, we can become very discouraged by the prospects for the future. Because how in the world can this final generation succeed for a better generation to fail. Because Christ is in us. Because we can do it only the life of Christ in us. Well, they had that too, didn't they? Paul had that. That, 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 that. That's how it would be done. But of course, previous generations also had those facilities as well. And none better than the Pentecostal church in Paul's day, right? And if a church with such power, such uh, personal association with Jesus Christ did not succeed back then, then you ask, what have we have today? To go and give a demonstration that he'll cut the work short in righteousness and finish it quickly, and he has, he has, he has means whereby he'll do that. But uh, about the only assurance we do have is that God has said he will do it, and he will do it, and for sure. That's, that's the certainty that that's going to be done. So then, in, in the long run, we'll find that everything is worth according to his will, and the 6,000 years of sin, sin's mastery upon mankind has shown how, how powerful sin is, how, how deep is his grip upon the human mind, and how hard it is to save persons from its power. Verse 12, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now, how, how is it that we are to the praise of God's glory? How is it in the coming kingdom God will give to us a position of excellence above the angels? Do you look upon yourself as a, as a person who praise to God's glory? Well, think about it. What uh, is the revelation of the person's character, what he does, what he achieves? Okay. Now, it is a small thing for Christ to come down and take a depraved, fallen, sinful, wretched man and transform that wreck into a shining, glorious saint. Is that a small achievement? That, that, that requires the power of God. And there's nothing that is the praise of God's glory so much as what he does for lost, perishing mankind. It's a marvellous achievement and very praiseworthy indeed. And therefore, when Jesus Christ takes his people home, they will be uh, to the praise of his glory, to the honour of his name, and to the vindication of his cause. And we ought to, to realise this, that... Uh, as they want to go forth to live out the Christian life, we have to realize that their lives are to be a witness to the saving power of Jesus Christ. And uh, let's turn to page 490 in the book of Star of Ages for a moment to pick up a point in regard to what we should be laying hold upon in respect to our present situation. 
page 490 in the book of Isaiah. So we have the book to be read uh, Beyond the Cross of Calvary, please. Beyond the Cross of Calvary, with his agony and sin, Jesus looks forward to the great final day. When the prince of the power of the air will meet his destruction in the earth, so long marred by his rebellion, Jesus beheld the work of evil forever ended, and the peace of God filling heaven and earth. Thank you, Tiger, please. Henceforth, henceforth, Christ's followers were to look upon Satan as a conquered foe. Upon the cross, he was to gain the victory for them. That victory he desired them to accept as his own, as their own. Behold, he said, I have given unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. The omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit is the defense of every contrite soul. Now one that is penitent, penitent and faith has claimed his protection. Not one that in penance and faith has claimed his protection will Christ permit to pass under the enemy's power. The Savior is by the side of the tempted and tried ones. With him there can be no such thing as failure, loss, impossibility, or defeat. We can do all things through him who strengthens us. When temptation and trials come, do not wait to adjust all the difficulties, but look to Jesus, your help. And the next paragraph, too, please. There are Christians who think and speak altogether too much about the power of Satan. They think of their adversary. They pray about him, they talk about him, and he looms up greater and greater in their imagination. It is true that Satan is a powerful being, but thank God we have a mighty Savior who casts out the evil one from heaven. Satan is pleased when we magnify his power. Why not talk of Jesus? Why not magnify his power and his love? Thank you very much. <clears throat> now I'd like to uh, go to Pledge of the Promise now and uh, have a statement there which we emphasized quite strongly several years ago in a series that is given then. And it's in the chapter dealing with the Red Sea. Um, path where God leads my mind will lead to the hesitancy, but it is a safe, yeah. safe path. Thank you, Nathan, you remember quite well. Uh, page 290 in the book, page Charms and Prophets. I'd like to emphasize this morning, from a the absolute fact that Satan is a defeated foe, and therefore he has no power to make us sin or, or give us in sickness, none whatsoever. Let's, let's think of this marvelous verse which says, Behold, I give unto you power to turn serpent and scorpion, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall any means hurt you. Let's go back to one or two incidents in the past to, to look at the magnitude of this promise and how valid and it is. When Moses was sent back to Pharaoh, he came back as a convicted murderer. He killed the Egyptian taskmaster 40 years before. There was a marked man in the land of Egypt. Yet God said to him, go back and speak to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. It was a terrifying assignment. Did it look, did, did it look from the human point of view to be suicidal? Yes. Absolutely. But Moses went at God's command and he walked in and out of Pharaoh's presence day after day and Pharaoh, Pharaoh did not touch him at all. He never imprisoned him, never chained him up, never restricted him. Moses enjoyed total and total freedom to do that. Isn't that amazing? It's absolutely amazing. Now, I see in that, of course, the fulfillment of these words which say, nothing shall by any means hurt you. The power of the enemy, nothing, just nothing at all, shall by any means hurt you. Uh, coming on to the departure of Israel from Egypt, the end of the Red Sea, and it looked as if they were going to be overwhelmed by the Egyptians again, slaughtered by the tens of thousands. Once again, nothing hurt them at all. If they'd been faithful to go all the way through, they would have found that experience would have been there right along. <coughs> now, coming to David's experience of going after the Amalekites, he came back to the Zikbag, as we read just the other day. And he asked the priest 
should he go after the enemy? And God told him to the priest, yes, he should. And as we said just the other day, he was 600 men, that was 400 men, wasn't it? To stay behind. 400 men pitted against a seasoned, powerful army of Amalekites. And they went in there and fought them all night and all day and did not sustain so much as a, a scratch or a wound at all. Marvelous, isn't it? Wonderful. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now we ought to realize this and as and, and not even think about Satan's power and strength. When 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 Goliath faced the Israelites back in David's day, the king Saul measured that giant by himself. Right? And was terrified by the presence of Goliath facing him across the valley. And Saul would not go down, mighty man as he was, to fight against that great Palestine champion. Now because because Goliath because Saul measures Goliath against himself, how does Goliath appear to him? Um, uncomfortable, huge, strong, and uncomfortable. Now when David came, he did not measure Goliath against David, or against Saul, or against any mighty man in Israel. What was the measuring line that David used in regard to this great giant. He came against the God of Israel. Right, he measured him against the power of God. And now, of course, the, the, the relationship is altogether different because when measured against the power of God, God was a very small enemy indeed. That's hardly a, a, a force to be reckoned with. So that as he went down there to fight against this giant, there, there was likewise found nothing shall by any means hurt you. He, he wasn't scratched or wounded in this battle whatsoever. Now, if we dwell upon Satan's power, he will do larger and larger now, thinking it's going to get smaller and smaller, and what's the sure outcome of that kind of uh, approach? Defeat and disaster for certain. So that uh, we need to spend time looking at the manifestation of God's power so we can measure all things by him and see all things in contrast to his mighty power. And we too shall find out to him in each hurt us. We're not here to sin. We'll be sick. We're here to be victorious and healthy. Amen. Okay. Yeah. How does that fit in with the martyrs of the past and the martyrs yet to be? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and, uh, well, yeah, they're still, they're still victors. And then the point is, this, of course, that uh, we're not in this world to escape sacrifice. We're to sacrifice. And therefore, it's a privilege on the part of God's mothers to die in the cause for Him. So wouldn't, wouldn't that promise be more of a spiritual application than a necessarily physical application? Oh, I think it's physical as well, very definitely. Right. Yeah.
we need to live too because we need to do with God's answer for the latter rain period coming up. And therefore, that are safe from physical and spiritual harm in the encounter with the, with the Satan's forces. So we shall be likewise also safe too if we abide with Christ as they did in fact and believe those great promises. Now, let, let's come to verse 13 now of the Ephesians the first chapter. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now, this trust that Paul talks about here is uh, something which goes a little bit beyond faith. There's faith and there's trust. What, 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 what is the difference? Is a difference between trust and faith.
Luther was given to the Ephesian church is called the gospel of your salvation. Now, what, are there more, is there more than one gospel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way, there's only one gospel in truth, and of course there are there are, there are, there are messages which claim to be the gospel, which are not the gospel. And there's all plenty of those, of course. Now, the gospel of your salvation, of course, is the power of God to save from sin. Romans 1, chapter, chapter 1, verse 16. So he was the power of God to save from sin, which is the word of truth, in which they put their trust, and having done so, having believed, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And are we clear on which, on which seal this is? There are two seals, aren't there? What's that? Sure. This is the first seal, as distinct from the second seal, which uh, the first seal, of course, was given to us in our day by day experience and involves the shutting out of sin and sinful desires. It's the sealing up of the body of citadel so it cannot be baited by the enemy. Let's go to 324 Desire Basis, I think, in this respect, to show the uh, power of this promise. And uh, 324, someone to read for me the, the paragraph which starts with when the soul surrenders itself to Christ. When the soul surrenders itself to Christ, a newer power takes possession of the new heart. A change is wrought, which man can never accomplish for himself. It is a supernatural work. Begin bringing a supernatural element into the community. The soul that is yielded to Christ becomes his own fortress, which he holds in a revolted world, and he intends that no authority shall be known in it but his own. A soul thus kept in possession by the heavenly agencies is impregnable to the assaults of Satan. Let's pause there, so I'm going to read the rest of this moment. Now, do you get the idea of a sealed fortress being portrayed in these words? Impregnable. Impregnable, right. Mm -hmm. And sealed, kept, the word kept, of course, means, uh, so they, they usually call the keep, didn't they, back in those old fortress, or, in English fortress or castles. So here's a picture then of uh, the body temple or body fortress being occupied by a supernatural force or a supernatural element brought into human nature and this becomes Christ's own fortress which he holds in a revolving world. Now, there, there is a picture then of a sealed citadel in which there can come no foreign element or agent whatsoever but the evil one is kept out. And in this sealing work, uh, it involves an intellectual and a spiritual uh, combination. You know, in what respect does, he, does intellectual operate?
it'll bring out what is there already in Christ, okay? And there should be no answering towards within, no response at all from the heart of the believer. So we must have the rest of the illustration. In this room, we're all non smokers, I assume. <laughs> I know we are all non smokers. Now, first of all, let's look at your minds, my mind, our, our minds. And in our minds, we have been conditioned, educated, and convinced that smoking is extremely bad practice, right? The conviction is so strong that the best advertising in the world would not persuade us to take a cigarette, right? That's the intellectual ceiling against that thing. But when someone comes close to you smoking a cigarette, does the general desire for you to smoke as well? Or is exactly right. So when Satan comes to you to tempt you to smoke, how much hope has he got? No, no whatsoever. None at all. None. Just none at all. So you're intellectually and spiritually sealed in respect of that sin, as we can plainly see. Now, what is true in that field is true in the other field as well. We have the same experience in every other field of temptation that can come against us. Now this daily sealing, of course, the preparation for the final seal, which which comes in the most holy place and uh, and uh, finally it's just the king of the king of Christ comes again. So maybe just have time to take our last verse before we go on. Now you seal the Holy Spirit of promise. In what way does the Holy Spirit of promise do the actual work of sealing? Once again he is a teacher of his of God's people, is he not? God is a teacher of his people through the Holy Spirit's ministry. Let's remember again the uh, picture of the sanctuary and uh, the seven brands of golden candlesticks are there on the left as you go into the building and they shed their soft, lovely light across the room and light up the, 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 the loaves of showbread upon the table on the other side. Now, the, the, the showbread, of course, was a symbol of our partake of the life of Jesus Christ, feeding upon him, being nourished by him. So his life becomes our life, his strength becomes our strength. But before we can appropriate the bread, we must have the light of God's truth on that bread, and the Holy, the Holy Spirit shines across the room as a teacher to teach us how to get the best from that bread on the other side of the room. So likewise, God is a teacher of his people today, and as we taught of him, we can correctly understand what the word of God has to say. Now, let's get this last verse, uh, verse 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the church is place in glory? Who is the guarantee of our inheritance? Who, who is that? The Holy Spirit. Right. So in what way is the Holy Spirit our gu guarantee? Because the of it. Say again. By the presence of the Holy Spirit. Well, the presence of the Holy Spirit affects it. Let's see how it affects it. He affects it. Paul says that our gospel didn't come to you in word only, but in righteousness and power and much assurance. Sure. But then we have the guarantee or the, or the certification, the preservation of our inheritance. Now, in the first instance, what is our inheritance? A new spiritual nature. Right? That's, that's our inheritance. And that must be preserved by us until the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And who alone has the power or, and, and who does the work of preserving that, 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 that inheritance? Right? He keeps, he, he keeps us from sinning and keeps us walking in the right path before God. But he preserves in us the condition or the qualification or the capacity to maintain that life which is the guarantee of our inheritance. But of course the work of the Holy Spirit is right along. I guess we'll leave it there now for the study period. And we'll be up again when we come back and have next period with you in this time. What uh, any, any questions or, or contributions? Yeah. Three or four questions. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, on the last point of the no smoking, yeah. it used to be that there's a no smoking that comes mainly from 
fear. Fear of death, fear of um, of dying. So the fear of death is that's a wrong motive. Fear of yes, but uh, if that person has a fear of death, uh, maybe in the peace of God he would turn in that direction because he would live in his life. There can be right Certainly. Another observation that I had on this is all on the dispensation. Most people look at us two dispensations, they say the Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, it's quite interesting because it goes along with what you were speaking of before, that the feel that there is a change in God to create the second dispensation. But the actual change from what you were saying has been enough. Christ, when he came on the cross, affected a change in us and brought us into the spirituality because we still offer sacrifices spiritually. The rite of circumcision is still valid spiritually. So, right? God couldn't reach us in that spiritual sense before, before Christ came. So he used that system act upon their minds so they could understand that. But since Christ came, we can understand spirituality, so we still offer the same sacrifice, spiritually. That's true, but we would, but today we do, uh, we can go spiritual Yes, because we're looking at the spirituality of all of it. Right. We're not looking at the physical thing. It's not that we do. Some people look at it. you're talking about we have to know the promises and you quoted Romans 8 Romans 10 where it says by hearing faith comes or faith comes by hearing and that really hit me one day that it's not enough just to know those promises you actually have to hear God say them to you and, and that's, there's, there's an impact there there's a difference there and I think we have to keep our focus on it's not just enough to memorize to know to be able to quote it it's got to be heard by God himself then the power comes with it. Sure. I've found that I must sit down and not just memorize, but actually feed upon the promise, think about it, play yeah. about it, it becomes a living thing, and it just becomes a place in my life. I thought I'd share, too, this uh, the blotting out of sin by E.J. Wagoner. He talks at the very end. He says, um, Their iniquity may be sought for, but it will not be found. It is forever gone from them. It is born to their new nature. And even though they may be able to recall the fact they have committed certain sins, they have forgotten the sin itself. They do not think of doing it anymore. Right. So that fit in very nicely. Very good. Well, it was just um, a promise, and it, there's a definition in here that I thought was was beautiful. In Desire of Ages 305, at the top of the page, men cannot manufacture peace. Human plans for the purification and uplifting of individuals or of society will fail of producing peace because they do not reach the heart. The only power that can create or perpetuate true peace is the grace of Christ. When this is implanted in the heart, it will cast out the evil passions that cause strife and dissension. Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall it come up, come up the myrtle tree, and life's desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. Very good. Yes, Margaret. Yes. Daniel and the street Frenchmen, they were in battle because of the sins of Israel. But, uh, 
God uses those things to purify and teach us valuable lessons.